Uh, all right, so hello everyone. Welcome to this first event of the EU Health Governance Network. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, we'll be talking today about the EU vaccine strategy and I'll get to introducing the session and our, our guest speaker in just a minute. But since this is the first event of the new network, we wanted just to say a little bit about what we've got planned and some of the other exciting things that are coming up in the field of EU health studies, given that there's so much going on. Um, I'm Eleanor Brooks, I'm one of the network coordinators, but I'm delighted to be sharing that role with Charlotte Godjevsky and Mary Guy. So I'm going to hand over to them just to briefly introduce themselves to say a little bit about EU HealthGov and, and what we're up to and some of the other initiatives that our colleagues are involved in as well. Um, so I'll give the floor straight away to Charlotte. Yes, thanks, uh, Ellie. So yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlotte Godjevsky and uh, welcome uh, to our Networks launch event. Uh, so EU HealthGov, uh, it's a research network that is funded um, for the coming three years by the uh, by UACES, which is the University Association for Contemporary European Studies. Uh, and we have a range of activities planned, uh, including panels at the UACES annual conference, uh, for which we also have uh, subsidies available for early career researchers. Uh, we're also organizing this uh, quarterly series of events, uh, which will take on different formats. So, for example, um, uh, work in progress presentations and in conversation dialogues but today uh, we're we're happy and honored to have a, a, pra a practitioner perspective and um, so if you'd like to stay in touch and learn more about our upcoming activities you can follow us on twitter so the uh, handle is at uh, eu health gov or visit our website euhealthgov.org uh, and on the website there's also a mailing list which you can uh, sign up to if you're interested and uh, on to mary Hello everyone, um, it's uh, great to see so many people joining us for our first uh, launch event for EU HealthGov, UAC's research network you know, for the next three years. So uh, in addition to what Charles mentioned about things that you can get involved with with us, um, we work quite closely with a couple of um, related groups you might be interested in. One is Health in Europe, which is a virtual seminar series where academics at all stages present work in progress attended by a wide range of both academics and policy practitioners uh, across Europe and also increasingly North America as well. So if you're interested in that, um, very interested to hear from you. Also, we have close links with the EU uh, Public Health Alliance, who now have public health and law and policy sections. So if you'd like to find out about any more about these initiatives, uh, there's more information under Get Involved on the EU HealthGov website. Um, enjoy the seminar. Over to Ellie. Thank you. Thank you both very much. We hope to see some people that are here at, at other events very soon. Today, for today, uh, we're talking about the EU vaccine strategy. Uh, the strategy was launched in June uh, of last year and it underpins the EU's negotiations with vaccine producers and also its wider role in enabling and supporting the vaccine rollout across Europe. As Charlotte mentioned, this is a Practitioner Perspectives event and we are thrilled to have Yanis Natsis from the European Public Health Alliance with us. For those who don't know uh, IFA, the, the Public Health Alliance, it's an umbrella group of NGOs. It's uh, around about 80 members now of health professionals, patient groups, disease groups, all advocating for better health policies within Europe. Yanis leads IFA's work on uh, universal access and affordable medicines. Uh, Yanis is a member of the European Medicines Agency's Management Board, also the board of the European Health Forum Gastein, and a founding member of the European Alliance for Responsible R&D uh, and Affordable Medicines. Uh, so very well placed to discuss the current state of EU vaccine policy with us. Um, thanks Yanis for, for joining us and welcome, it's nice to see you. Thank you for having me and thank, thank you for you. fostering this discussion at this stage. I would say it's quite timely and it's good that we're having this discussion now in late May 2021 rather than let's say in January or February when, when this issue was dominating the headlines in a rather sensational uh, way. It's better now that the situation that the dust is settling a bit and it is it's still early to draw some conclusions but I think it is timely to have uh, a first overview, what lessons can we learn, and of course, how the experience of last year, um, continuing until this spring, I would say, how it feeds into um, and shaping uh, future uh, developments in, in medicines policies in the EU. Mm, good. Yes, I absolutely agree with, with uh, the timing is fortuitous. Um, and I'll say a little bit uh, towards the end about some of the other resources from EFA that you can access. Yanis has been doing an excellent discussion series 
uh, on EU vaccine and pharmaceutical policy as this has gone through. So I, I think there's some valuable resource there. Just before I hand over to Yanis uh, for the presentation, just a quick note about questions. So we'll be feeding some questions to Yanis in the Q&A after the initial intervention. The chat box is opening, Mary and Charlotte are keeping an eye on things for us. Um, so feel free to type your questions in there and I can read them out or you can make a note that you'd like to have the floor and I'll, I'll come to people as and when we're ready. You can also join the discussion on Twitter. Um, the hashtag is EUHG vaccines or EU HealthGov vaccines. Um, so do log on and, and carry on discussions there. Um, but with that, I will hand over to Yanis for as long as you need, Yanis, and, uh, and then we'll start some Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for having me. Congrats on this new initiative. Uh, happy to support it in any and every way we can, also in the future. Um, for the EU vaccine strategy, let's let's go back a bit in time. Um, we are back in last uh, May, uh, where there's for the first time there are already discussions happening on the other side of the Atlantic around the vaccines. Of course, the whole world is talking about vaccines. In Brussels, we have the Commission President um, launching her online pledging conferences, uh, promising that the vaccines will be, if we get to a point where we have multiple vaccines, the, the, those will be. Um, public uh, global public goods. Uh, we have a lot of discussions uh, from the um, White House under the Trump administration at the time that, of course, the America is going to be served first. And then in late May, early June, four governments in Europe, Germany, France, Netherlands and Italy, announced that they've um, forged an alliance called the Inclusive Vaccine Alliance, IVA. And a few days later, they announced that they already have signed a contract the first contract with AstraZeneca, the contract that we've heard so much about and it's still dominating the news to this day. So the IVA composed of these four very important and interesting uh, constellation, I would say, of member states, um, signed the first contract with AstraZeneca, a big contract. Uh, at the time it was 300 million doses uh, with an option to buy 100 million more. Um, and of course, with companies, including AstraZeneca, and actually AstraZeneca was the first one to say that we're not going to make any money, we're not going to make any profit, um, and it will come at a very, very low, uh, um, affordable, cheap uh, price. Uh, the pharmaceutical industries, um, via their trade associations, they organized at the same time uh, around, I think it was already in April last year, um, uh, virtual uh, online press conferences saying that they will not make profit out of these vaccines. So we are in early June, the IVA, the Inclusive Vaccine Alliance, Germany, France, Netherlands, Italy, they say we sign a contract with AstraZeneca. The contract is not just for us, it's also for EU, uh, the rest of the EU member states. A few days later, literally a few days later, the European Commission comes out with its own joint procurement initiative which is what Ellie called the EU vaccine strategy. So the EU vaccine strategy is essentially the, the a learning curve, for sure, a learning curve for the European Union. And I can say, uh, and I have no doubt about it, that it is a success story uh, with some important uh, flaws. But I think we can say with certainty that um, it is a success story because it prevented a divided Europe. And uh, I would also like to add that it is indeed, uh, we need to give a bit of the benefit of the doubt um, because it is a learning uh, process. It's an exercise for the commission, but also for the member states. I remember talking to several delegations at the time, they were skeptical. Will the commission be fast enough, sufficiently quick enough? Is there gonna be, is the whole process going to be delayed because of the usual way of, the Brussels way of doing things? Will member states be happy? Will so there were a lot of there was a lot of skepticism. That's for sure. Um, I should explain how the EU vaccine strategy works, uh, at least during its first baby steps. Um, there was a steering board composed of all 27 EU member states, um, with a subgroup of EU member states, about seven EU member states, um, which uh, were members of the negotiation task force. Uh, what does this mean? This means that those seven member states, they were obviously reporting to their uh, friends from the other 20 uh, member states of the EU, that those seven member states were uh, concretely and specifically mandated, tasked to negotiate with individual pharma companies over the vaccine candidates. 
how did it work? Also with the AstraZeneca contract, and I, I, I didn't start my presentation uh, by chance, mentioning that there was already a first contract before the EU uh, vaccine strategy was even officially launched, because that contract was then, I would say, subsequently uh, absorbed by the EU. Uh, and then the, the, the contract was officially signed by the European Union um, in August in late August, so two months later. Of course, there is not sufficient transparency and transparency has been <laughs> uh, getting things and being uh, finding out what's happening behind the scenes has been a struggle uh, for us civil society throughout the process, a very frustrating and, and, and I would say disappointing uh, struggle. Um, everything around COVID-19 has been uh, a struggle when it comes to getting access to information. Um, but specifically when it comes to the negotiations with pharma, we cannot, we don't know if there are any differences between the um, first contract uh, regarding AstraZeneca, which was signed by the FDA, and the contract which was then signed by the European Union. We don't have this comparison uh, between the first and the second. I mean, actually it's one contract, but you understand what I mean, the contract uh, signed by the four governments and then taken over by the EU. What was the main tool that the EU had at its disposal when it talked to pharma? Uh, governments went to the companies and said, guys, we need a vaccine as soon as possible. We need it yesterday. Um, and we are willing to meet you halfway, which is understandable. Uh, we are willing to de-risk the R&D process. How? By giving you money to boost the manufacturing capacity, which is an issue, obviously, that I will come to later on. Um, we will give you money, guarantee any possible losses in order to uh, literally entice the companies, lure the companies to actually invest in this, in this process. Um, there was, so there was this insurance policy that the EU, in a very generous, I would say, way, um, offered the companies uh, so that the companies would actually embark on this uh, endeavor. Um, the, I would say there was a, the honeymoon period it was definitely over last summer. There were negotiations going on. And then we get to late last August when there is, um, when we had a, a front page story in the Financial Times uh, revealing um, that there was an, industri an, in uh, an internal memo uh, leaked uh, to the Financial Times, revealing that companies were pushing for an unprecedented civil liability exemption in these negotiations with EU governments in order to cover their backs, essentially, in case things go wrong uh, with these uh, vaccines. Mind you, and I think it is worth repeating and, and reiterating, that at that stage we had the vaccines were still an idea. So companies were approaching the EU and also individual go government saying, we have this promising data, very early data, clearly. Um, this is your opportunity. There was also a bit of pressure, I would say, from the companies. Uh, I want to take you again a bit back in time. Re may you may remember that in May, uh, the CEO of Sanofi, and Sanofi hasn't still, has still to produce a vaccine, and it is one of the big players in the world as a, as a vaccine manufacturer. But uh, last May, May 2020, the CEO of Sanofi made some remarks saying that um, if there is to be a Sanofi vaccine, we will give it first to the US. So the companies as well, what I'm trying to say is that the US, the, the companies themselves, they were trying to fuel this scarcity or I would say competition across different jurisdictions, uh, namely the, the US, Europe and other markets, obviously. And everyone knew that um, if there is to be a successful vaccine, everyone would want it, obviously. There would be multiple clients waiting in line. And, and about that, one of the key priorities of the EU vaccine strategy was to make sure that the EU would get to jump the queue and to secure the doses. Those were the two key, absolutely key, uh, predominant priorities of the um, EU pool procurement initiative. The Financial Times uh, front page story um, around the uh, push, the industry push for uh, these uh, unprecedented civil liability exemption, at least for the EU standards, because such an exemption exists in the US legislation did cause a public outcry and brought center stage, I would say, the issue of the 
astonishing lack of transparency in the negotiations. Astonishing because we're talking about big chunks of EU public funds, but also public funds going to the companies um, to strengthen them, uh, also from individual member states. I mean, we've all read the, the headlines, uh, hundreds of millions of euros given by the French government to, to French pharma companies. The same happened also to um, uh, the Pfizer's uh, partner in Germany by the German government. Uh, so there was a multi-layered, astonishing lack of transparency uh, as to the negotiations, as to the terms and conditions of the contracts, um, because these contracts, for instance, the liability issue is not uh, it's a public health issue at the end of the day. It's a patient safety issue. And, and what we, civil society, um, were trying to remind policymakers is that you cannot simply expect that there will be no questions asked when a few individuals behind closed doors, even if they have the best intentions in the world and they are mandated by their governments, obviously, right? Because they were member states' uh, governments um, negotiating the contracts. You cannot expect that people are not going to have questions as to these contracts. And of course, what we kept saying, uh, if uh, along with a broad coalition of organizations was, you need to be proactively transparent to guarantee the trust in the vaccines, which for me is a key priority, where you don't want to fuel <laughs> vaccine hesitancy. You want to make sure that if you get to the point where you have vaccines, people will be willing to take them. And of course, you know, one year later, all of these, these issues are um, daily <laughs> on the news, of course. Um, but what we were saying back then is that you need to guarantee that there is, you need to be practically transparent. And if you are practically transparent, this is the only way to guarantee that there is an overall trust in the public management of the crisis. Um, uh, and, and to safeguard, as I said, uh, vaccine confidence, patient safety, and overall public health, obviously. And don't get me wrong, there is no, the, the, the demands coming from the government side were quite strong. Governments were pushing the companies to deliver. So governments had to meet companies halfway. The question was not to give them a blank check. And what do I mean by a blank check? I mean that the industry, and, and I've known from my experience working on these topics, the industry is, the industries rather, plural, not to give the impression that the industry as a whole acts as one because it's a pretty diverse business sector, obviously, but, the industry is using the pandemic and has been using the pandemic. And obviously the fact that governments are heavily dependent on uh, big pharma at this stage for the obvious reasons, the industry normally and, uh, and logically speaking is trying to create precedents, is trying, is trying to revive agendas uh, that were not successfully uh, endorsed uh, in the past. We see now that there is, and I think Ellie will come to these points uh, uh, later on. Um, in my view, we see a, a, a risky conflation of, of uh, public health policies with industrial policies. And that's, that's something which in combination with the fact that uh, there is this incredible politicization of pharma, which I've never seen before. Um, and with the fact that pharma CEOs pick up the phone and they talk directly to heads of states and governments. Um, this is something which is here to stay. It is changing the dynamic. Um, and of course, uh, I have an issue with that in the sense that companies are indispensable partners and players, but right now they're no longer a mere business sector. They have become, they have been elevated. They are uh, and, and, and a key political interlocutor uh, with disproportionate clout, in my opinion, and uh, more uh, more worryingly, I would say, with uh, with zero or very or little oversight and and the need to be accountable. So this is this is, I would say, my my concern. Um, and of course, uh, going back to the timeline, um, there was the, there was increasing scrutiny. Uh, as a result of that uh, financial, uh, financial Times front page story of last uh, August or early September, the commission was bombarded with repeated questions, numerous questions, and on repeated on several occasions from across the political spectrum, by the way, across the political spectrum, um, questions regarding the use of the public money, 
of the public guarantees, questions around uh, the liability, questions around the manufacturing and the and the, the commitments that the companies undertook when they signed um, these contracts. So things where there was this scrutiny and there was this outcry and the, the demand for transparency coming from civil society, coming from political groups. September, October last year, November, uh, we were putting a lot of pressure on the commission. And then uh, finally, uh, there was for the first time ever, I think in my, in my experience at least, um, a contract published, uh, redacted by the commission. The commission, first of all said, okay, you know, we cannot give you access to the contracts, but maybe what we can consider is we can give you access to a select, we can give access, we can grant access to a select few MEPs, members of the European Parliament, they can go and, and read their these contracts in a secure room, in a reading room, without any phones on them. They have to sign a, a very strict non-disclosure agreement. They will be shot if they reveal anything about them, what they read um, in that in those reading rooms. Of course, that was a farce that created a lot of problems. And then the Commission finally, uh, which is an imp important precedent, published a redacted version of the contract. And then Christmas came, and then there was a lot of political pressure um, uh, to start start vaccinations because there were also developments happening in the UK, in Israel. Uh, there was pressure on the EMA to accelerate the approvals um, and to, to green light these products because a lot of contracts were signed by then. And then the honeymoon continued. I, I, would, say, I would say the honeymoon between the European Commission and the national capitals continued until early December. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen wanted for PR reasons to have the initial vaccinations starting already before the end of 2020. And then the problem started in January 2021 with uh, AstraZeneca, which confirmed what we were always saying uh, for us working in this field that pharma companies tend to overpromise and underdeliver. Um, and then, of course, uh, the commission the, was grilled and there was a severe attack um, against the commission to, to hold it accountable and to say, why didn't you, was, were the contracts very weak with the companies? Was there too much stick and not, rather, sorry, was there too much carrot and not enough stick in those contracts? So, uh, and, and we, what we know now, uh, the, the best efforts, <laughs> the language that was used in the contract with AstraZeneca because then the commission was forced to publish the contract after this uh, tremendous public backlash, which was a huge uh, reputational damage uh, for Brussels. Obviously, you know, member states are very quick to put the blame on Brussels, but I need to tell you that especially certain member states were very much hands-on when it came to the negotiations since day one. So to simply um, shift the blame to Brussels is, is, is uh, hypocritical. Uh, and inaccurate, it's false. Um, but of course, that is not to say that, that is not to exonerate Brussels because Brussels also made a lot of mistakes. And of course, and I will wrap up here and then we can continue with questions. Um, we've seen, of course, AstraZeneca uh, dominated the headlines, but there have been other issues as well um, with other contracts. So even these days we see that uh, J&J &J, uh, is unable to deliver uh, what they uh, promised and there, of course, there is a discussion, and I think we need to have this proper assessment of what went well and what went wrong. And we need to see, um, and we don't have that assessment yet. Uh, and we need to learn from this process and not simply, you know, bash it or, or dismiss it, because I repeat, for me, it is a success story. Uh, look at where we are now, and I think we're going to be flooded with doses, especially by the fall. Um, and this is ongoing. Elia, I'll stop here and then hand over to you to have some questions. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Janice. That was clear and insightful and helpful um, overview of the timeline there. Uh, there's a couple of questions coming in on the Q&A in the chat, but I'll just remind people that those are open. So if you want to um, ask things, do you post questions there and I'll, I'll put those to Janice or, or give you the floor. Um, I definitely have a bunch of stuff I wanted to ask. The first thing I wanted to ask is about the, the vaccine strategy itself. So it has two pillars, right? And one pillar is about the EU, about the joint procurement uh, mechanism, about purchasing and contracts and negotiations. But the other pillar is about amending the current regulatory system for quality and safety and efficacy 
to allow the drugs to be developed faster and pushed through faster. You've talked a bit about the first pillar. Is there anything to say on the second pillar? Does EFA have any concerns about the way in which that's being done or the changes that are being made and how permanent they are perhaps and whether these things are likely to hang around longer than, than maybe we envisage that they will do when they're introduced? Yes, this is um, it is a sensitive point. Uh, the industry wants to accelerate that. COVID-19 and the, the way that the therapeutics, so both be they uh, medicines or the vaccines have been approved in a, with the rolling review by the EMA. I think the EMA uh, has handled enough because I'm on the board of the agency. I think the EMA has been proactively transparent and that's very, very important. And I defend um, the EMA's decision to go to follow the conditional marketing authorization uh, avenue. Um, Although there was a tremendous political pressure, I think, from different sides. I mean, you just had to read the news um, uh, and the, the statements coming from different politicians uh, across EU member states, putting the pressure on the agency to accelerate. But I think we, we shouldn't play games with this because uh, there is a lot of at stake, and namely the trust in citizens' uh, faith, that the citizens' faith in the approvals system. We cannot jeopardize that. And that is something that I think we've all hopefully learned, uh, as, as well as, because you mentioned the regulatory dimension, the need to strengthen the pharmacovigilance system in Europe. Um, when, when we decide to put products on the market early on with a high degree of uncertainty, we need at the same time to be sure that we have a, a robust uh, pharmacovigilance system uh, to, to, to safeguard public health and to end patient safety. Um, there is, you know, for me, COVID-19, and, and that's how I started off by saying that the industry is using it to push for different agendas. I think one of the, those agendas is indeed um, accelerated approvals, let's call it like that. Uh, it is not necessarily bad, but it should not be, you know, the system is already flexible enough, in my opinion, and it shouldn't be, the exception cannot become the norm. Of course, if we're looking at the crisis, at the, an emergency, um, as part of the crisis response, we can entertain different options. But I think what we've seen is that, and I know there were a lot of politicians saying, oh, you know, the EMA was slow. I don't believe that. It, it, the, the, even if there were like, there was a lag of two weeks or three weeks, that was totally, totally worth it. It was not due to bureaucracy. It is something that is important so that we see how important even today, the question of vaccine hesitancy. You don't want to fuel this. You don't want to fuel vaccine hesitancy. You don't want to fuel anti-vaxxers. And the two things are, are, are distinct. But we need to be very careful with this. We cannot change things just overnight under the pressure of, 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 the, of the circumstances. I think, that's, I think that's exactly right. I guess, so do you see a risk? I'm thinking because the joint procurement, the, the system by which we're now collectively purchasing medicines that we've used for the vaccines, it's new per se, but it builds on existing mechanisms that we had before, right, that, that were starting to come to fruition. Equally, in the, in the other pillar, this push for sort of accelerated um, approval and, and expedited processes, the industry was already pushing for that before as well, right? We had a, a series of measures. So I guess what I'm, what I'm asking is, given that these things aren't new to COVID, they are things that were in train before and agendas that existed before, what is the risk of us bringing them into place in response to COVID and then them staying of a sort of institutional stickiness where once we've set the precedent and we put these measures in place and these mechanisms in place, they then just end up residing. In well, the, the, the risk is very clear, lowering, lowering the bar for approving medicines mm -hmm. in general. So um, beyond vaccines, right? Because vaccines is a special deal. Okay. Um, the question is, do you want to, because already healthcare systems are struggling with the, the, the conundrum of uh, weak evidence at the time of approval and very high prices. And this is something which has nothing to do with COVID. It, it was before, as you said, and it will be with, with us once the pandemic is more, let's say, uh, under control. And that is my concern that if we are to, and of course we saw, um, I don't know how to what extent our, our audience is familiar with this, but now with COVID-19, everything happened at the time of the marketing authorization. Health technology assessment with all of this politicization and with pharma CEOs picking up the phone and, and, and calling uh, heads of government directly, you know, even sidelining completely ministries of health and where the real expertise lies, HTA, health technology assessment, uh, took a backseat. That should not be the norm. That should not be the norm. The question is how do you uh, uh, 
I'm not saying not modernize the regulatory system if, if there is a need to do so, obviously. But as you said, I've seen and I've been in this field long enough to remember uh, very concrete um, industry pushes to loosen up the criteria and to move the goalposts and in order in the definition of innovation. And, um, and I think those agendas are currently revived. And indeed, as I said before, because of the politicization, because of the, um, of the disproportionate uh, increase in, in the company's influence right now, let's, let's, let's not be naive. Um, uh, the, the companies are using this, uh, these entry points uh, to push for a lot of different things. For instance, I think the industry uh, will push for a similar, I mean, uh, permanent <laughs> um, civil liability exemption as we see in the US legislation. Right. So this is a concrete example, along with a series of other examples, like for instance, the industry is very happy with the uh, sharing the risk, the whole de-risking with public money and the whole, um, all sorts of incentives and flexibilities and guarantees which are granted to the industry. As I said, don't get me wrong, to a certain extent, especially when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines development, that was necessary, right? But from now on, this kind of coming together, joining forces, the public-private partnerships, yes, but we need to get it right because we're, we're talking about billions in public funds. Mm -hmm. You, you talked a bit about transparency. I wonder if, um, particularly thinking about the work that I know Aoife has done in the past on TTIP, on the, on the trade negotiations, yeah. can you reflect a bit on the similarities or indeed if we're seeing any progress in terms of transparency? Has the transparency been better in this situation than it was, for example, when, when Aoife was working on TTIP? Um, Ellie, I must tell you that we, we were very um, frustrated in Brussels, and this is why the, the, the calls for, for the Commission to show us the contracts effectively, um, because these contracts are, especially the COVID-19 vaccines related contracts, are very important for obvious reasons, right? Because the whole world was waiting for these contracts and for these vaccines, for these vaccines rather, but linked to these contracts. Um, no, it has been a struggle, as I said, uh, and I think the Commission, the irony is that the Commission was pushing against transparency. Well, they did publish the first contract was published in the CureVac, if I'm not mistaken, was published before the whole AstraZeneca uh, thriller. But then when the AstraZeneca thriller or fiasco or call it whatever you want started, the commission sought refuge in transparency. <laughs> so right. they went from, from, from pushing against transparency to like saying, yeah, we are going to publish the contract. We have nothing to be afraid of. And of course, you know, today is the first day of the trial of the lawsuit. And we can come to that. But um, no, I'm, I, I hope uh, transparency in pharma, we, were, we had some baby steps in favor of transparency in pharma overall, because pharmaceutical systems, there is a series of imbalances in pharmaceutical systems in Europe, also as a result of the information asymmetry. And the information asymmetry is a result of the fact of the confidentiality agreement. So before COVID-19, we had some promising um, baby steps uh, that showed that governments were becoming rather skeptical of the confidentiality uh, terms in the, in the agreements with, with the industries. And they were starting even to doubt themselves, to question themselves. Is this the right way? Should we move towards transparency? But then COVID-19 happened. The pressure of the, of, and the scale of the crisis was such that obviously the industry wants to absolutely safeguard the secretive way of doing business. That's for sure. Uh, going also to your question before, what does the industry want to create as a legacy, as a lasting legacy out of COVID-19? Um, the, the fact that they want to absolutely safeguard uh, uh, secrecy and, and confidentiality. Um, I hope that now we have these contracts. I must say that the Commission has published these contracts. Some of them are heavily redacted, so it's a bit of a, um, uh, it's ludicrous, to put it simply. Uh, this is not transparency. Um, and, but there are three layers of transparency, if I may. The first one is to obviously publish those contracts with a minimum of reductions. The second one is to publish the, the communication between um, pharma, individual pharma companies, and the commission uh, during all these months of negotiations, because we're looking at many different, and now we have a second generation of contracts. 
And the third layer of transparency, which is, in my opinion is equally important and not just for historical reasons, but as I said, in, in this needs assessment and also review of what we've learned and what we've done so far, this third layer of assessment of, of transparency is important. And that is uh, what was communicated by the commission to the member states uh, within the steering board. So who knew what and when? So these are for me the three layers of transparency. And as civil society, we are saying that transparency must be the starting point of any future uh, future negotiation when I'm talking about EU pool procurement. Because Ellie, let's be let's be honest. You can be you can be more demanding if you are the EU. If you're Slovakia or Greece and, and you are negotiating with, with a giant or a titan, because companies were giants before the COVID-19, now they're titans, there you cannot play, the, the level is different. But when you are the EU, you can use your leverage. So my, my point of concern and my criticism is that EU used its leverage effectively in some ways and failed miserably to use its leverage in uh, other ways. And we can come to that. Well, let's come to that since you mentioned it. Where are the ways yes. that they've used it effectively and where are the ways where they could and should have been able to do more? Uh, prices, I think um, we're very, we got affordable, relatively affordable prices uh, for this first round. For me, uh, I don't see a problem. And there, you know, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of, let's call them stakeholders uh, who, um, when the problem started with the AstraZeneca and when, uh, when all of that was happening in the media, they were saying, oh, you know, the EU was stingy. Mm -hmm. uh, had we been more um, uh, generous, uh, we wouldn't have, we would have been, uh, more in the front of the queue, right? Because we said that that was the top, the top priority to jump the queue. Uh, I disagree with that. I disagree with that, especially because AstraZeneca was very affordable from the beginning. The contract, the um, so that even if we had paid like two or three euros more, it wouldn't have. It would have made zero um, difference. Um, and also, I have a serious problem with this kind of narrative because this is the kind of narrative that paves for excessive prices more broadly in medicines. And it, it fuels and it nourishes this, this discourse that says, oh, you know, what is the value? We, should have, we could have paid 5 billion more or 3 billion more or 10 billion more because the value, what is the, that is the value of, of keeping the economy open. You know, if you go down that path, then the next vaccines that will come our way will have even higher prices. And then you can also price the midwife as, as an extremely, <laughs> you know, uh, expensive uh, service. So that for me, it really uh, justifies um, uh, the, the excessive prices that we saw in medicines more broadly before COVID-19. And it uh, exonerates the industry and practically it distracts us from the industry's responsibilities. Um, and to the second point of your question, so I think on prices we did well uh, and rightly so it has been a priority. Um, the um, where the EU could have used this leverage is very simply uh, on the question of manufacturing. Let's go back to last summer. The industry is talking to companies, sorry, the, the, the companies are talking to governments nonstop on all layers of power. In Brussels, on the national level, there, there are numerous channels of communication. So, as I said, and this is why we need, we need to shed light into what happened in those negotiations, because we don't know. What was the industry telling the governments, the negotiators back then? Don't worry, are we gonna, we're gonna be fine with manufacturing. We've taken care of it. Where, was that what they were saying to the governments? Because as I said earlier, everyone knew, I mean, you and I, we understand it's, com it's common sense. Everyone knew that when the product, if we were to get to a product and by, by early fall, we were pretty confident that we we're gonna get to some, to multiple successful uh, vaccines. Everyone knew that everyone would want those vaccines. So at least in those contracts, you should have had more teeth in those contracts to make sure that you would be in, indeed, because that was your, your objective as the EU, that you would indeed be in the front of the queue. Mm -hmm. and, and that AstraZeneca, I'm taking a, an example, would have said, you know, I put aside this percentage of my production for the EU. So that was very, those, the contracts were very vague and they are very vague when it comes to the commitments that the companies were undertaking. So there, uh, the EU could have been and should have been more, uh, could have been stricter and should have been stricter when it comes to the manufacturing or forcing companies to um, share their technology 
or forcing companies to work together. So the, the, the whole contract manufacturing, which started only in February and March, and the matchmaking, you know, that one company is going to produce the vaccine of the other company in order to scale up uh, manufacturing. Everyone knew that this would be a problem. And this is why the EU uh, used the down payments of about 3 billion on top of national subsidies that we have no clue how much money went into those subsidies. But let's talk about the EU funds. Almost 3 billion went in down payments to boost the manufacturing capacity because everyone knew that that would be an issue. So, so that is you, something where, yeah, go ahead. So, I'm just to, to clarify. So are you saying that this issue with, because a lot of it we know came down to a lack of production capacity, right? And I agree with you that in a way, that's why the prices narrative is annoying because it suggests that the money was the only factor. And actually what we know is that no. we didn't used to make vaccines in this kind of quantities and it was always going to be impossible to scale up in the way that we needed to in such a short space Correct. of time. But is the point that you're making that if we had restructured the contracts, we could have done that in a way where companies work together and shared yes. um, information and technologies to a, to a point where we could actually have scaled up production or- Or, or to have, to have less, less scarcity maybe. Perhaps okay. it's true we wouldn't have avoided the scarcity or we wouldn't also, to be very honest with you, I think the scarcity, especially in the months of January, February, possibly even March was artificial in a way, partially artificial. Um, and that's, uh, I'm not being cynical, it's just a, a typical business strategy of companies, you know, you want to fuel uh, the demand. <laughs> um, and, um, but that, of course, we will never know. The, the, what I am simply saying is that six months earlier, so as I said, last summer, last October, November, uh, we could have inserted provisions in the contracts where um, the companies would have felt more the pressure to deliver or to be more realistic or simply not lie, as I said, not over promise and under deliver. Because, you know, I interviewed um, Clemens Auer um, of Austria, who, is, uh, who used to be until recently the, the co-chair of the EU steering board. So he has uh, key insights into the negotiations. And he, he said um, that, you know, we knew that there would be scarcity. We, we expected that there would be uh, scarcity. Um, but we also know that some companies uh, lied to us effectively, some others didn't. So I don't want to generalize, right? Because there are companies who seem to have delivered more or they, they, they seem to have been more realistic as to... But of course, now, my concern is that from the public's side, the negotiators should have been aware. I understand that they were, a lot, they were under a lot of pressure coming from a lot of different sides, and we need to be aware of that. But uh, those negotiating these kind of contracts should have known that uh, the or should have seen the scarcity coming and if they had seen the scarcity coming then they should have also told the politicians because the politicians but also the negotiators were kind of hyping the expectations i remember there were a lot of public events in september and october saying oh you know we just need a few more weeks the all of the signatures will be done uh, all the contracts will be signed uh, and then um, we just need the green light from the ema and then we will have all these doses but that was false Mm -hmm. That was only part of the story. That was only part of the truth. And we saw that, um, uh, and at the same time, there was also the problem of the export bans and restrictions. And that's why I think it was clear on the negotiators' minds that they wanted the, most of these vaccines to be produced on European soil, because everyone knew that there would be bans coming, for instance, imposed in the US, and there wouldn't be vaccines leaving the US, because that's we know that this is how the operation works speed, and this is how, in general, uh, there is, you know, the U.S. Uh, launch first uh, policy in medicines in general. Right, right. In I want to talk to you about the European soil point, but I will be hogging the Q&A. So I'm going to just take a question or two from the audience. So there's one in the Q&A that's uh, from Sabrina Liu, and it says, could you assess the role of the EU in health diplomacy globally? And by this, we mean vis-a-vis -vis other players such as the WHO or the US or other relevant international actors. Yes, um, I, I, I must say that I'm not an expert. I haven't followed uh, this debate because I was focusing a lot on what was happening with the contracts per se in Europe. But I, I can say that, um, you know, I remember uh, last spring, all of these, and I think you remember them as well, Sabrina, uh, those high profile Eurovision-like um, uh, pledging conferences hosted by the, by the commission president herself bringing together heads of state, pledging for um, uh, global public goods. Um, that was hypocritical 
that was hypocritical because at the same time, um, I, I know because I was talking to the people who were in uh, doing those negotiations, the absolute priority was to make sure that we have the doses secured for uh, Europeans. Let's let's be honest about it. It's not. Uh, so there were a lot of discussions in Brussels, a lot of mechanisms set up and a lot of, uh, for me, those, especially last summer and early for those were smoke screens because uh, vaccine nationalism, vaccine nationalism was the, 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 um, the policy that the EU followed uh, until at least the point where the doses were secured, but really secured and they were only secured very recently, as you saw, uh, for Europeans. And then everything else came in uh, second. Um, so, because what I'm trying to say is that equity was not even guaranteed or was not even a given for Europeans uh, per se, let alone, um, uh, you know, giving doses to uh, third uh, countries. I wonder if I could ask you to expand a bit, because I know IFA and, and several of its members do a lot of work on vaccine equity within Europe and, and some of the problems yes. we're having with, with reaching the right groups. Can you say a little bit about... Absolutely. Challenges? And thank you. Thank you for drawing attention to this. Yes, uh, we are. You know, of course, the vaccine equity in Europe is not, uh, and we shouldn't um, uh, forget the, the global vaccine equity dimension. But as Ellie said, yes, we are raising the profile of, and the need um, to um, include and prioritize vulnerable populations and communities in Europe. Uh, and of course, you know, national vaccination plans, national vaccination plans have largely been dependent on companies' business plans. <laughs> Let's be honest, because um, I've been talking to a lot of uh, people involved in designing the national campaigns, the vaccination campaigns, and they were like, well, you know, we're hesitant. We don't want to vaccinate a lot of people. And that was like a couple of months ago, just a month, a month and a half ago. They were like, we don't want to hesitate. We, we are hesitating to, to vaccinate um, a lot of people because we're not sure we will have the second dose when the time comes for these people who already got the first dose. So that is quite, I think it's quite telling uh, of, of, of uh, how, of the, of the problems with the contracts. Uh, that brings us to the previous discussion. So uh, the question of vaccine equity, absolutely. And it is the time, you know, also to strengthen the, the role of the ECDC. Uh, in Brussels, there are ongoing negotiations uh, in the package of the European Health Union, uh, which was put forward by the Commission to uh, expand the, date, the mandate of the EMA and to strengthen the mandate of the ECDC to make sure that we monitor equity, we need to make sure that we develop the right indicators to assess and to measure equity in Europe when it comes to vulnerable populations, because right now we have no clue, uh, no clue whatsoever if you know, we have vaccinated the refugees, the migrants, the homeless, no clue. And especially now, uh, 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 with summer approaching, um, the, the top priority is simply to vaccinate anyone and everyone in kind of a, a random way. Uh, but then, of course, that creates problems because um, you don't address vaccine hesitancy in the, these hard to reach populations and many, many other topics. So indeed, uh, within IFA, uh, with our members, but also partners, we sent a letter to three commissioners asking, you know, outlining concrete actions um, and more to follow on this, because I think it is important. It is an opportunity, if you want. It is an opportunity to address through the COVID-19 vaccination, to address longstanding health inequalities. And, and, and you know, that's, that's where I, I have a bit of hope. Yeah, I, I think we see some of that with the health union proposals, right? I mean, within those, there's, there's, there are new proposals for health uh, inequality indicators and, and, and the ECDC working to help us map these much better across and in between member states. Um, related slightly to that, a uh, question from Charlotte uh, says, how do you expect the EU's role to evolve in the future also in relation to competencies that are downstream of, of vaccine procurement? So we're thinking in particular here of the digital green certificates, for instance. How do you see the EU's role in this sort of thing evolving? As we go forward. Two points. Uh, first, on I think the EU, uh, and I'm, I'm happy with it, there is a prospect, there is a potential for uh, uh, Brussels-driven uh, joint procurement uh, for medicines in general. I think this is, you know, we, we as civil society, we've always fav favored member states coming together, joining forces, um, and we've seen that. Uh, in light of the excessive prices for some medicines, member states realized only in the very recent past, over the past five years only, so very recently, 
that they can no longer afford not to work together. So now they are working together. I, I will mention Beneluxa, which is kind of a household name, if, if I may describe it this way. The Valletta Declaration, different groups of countries coming together in an intergovernmental regional way, uh, realizing you know, that they need to address the um, information asymmetry and the power imbalance with the companies by simply uh, organizing themselves better and exchanging information. Companies, as I said, they love the divide and conquer strategy. This is the, the strategy they've always used. So um, the response to the divide and conquer strategy is to join forces uh, and exchange information. It doesn't matter in the end if they will buy products together or not, as long as there is a, a shared baseline of information so that companies know that they cannot fool, they cannot deceive the governments, to put it very simply. The second point, the digital green certificate, you know, I have a bit of an issue with these um, flashy initiatives, very flashy. You know, we are trying to rescue the summer and, you know, if everyone wants to be uh, seen to be acting. I have a, a bit of an issue how this will be used in the future. Of course, I have an issue because uh, not everyone is vaccinated. There are a lot of, I don't want to create um, double or three tiers of uh, society. But unfortunately, you know, these issues now seem to be... Uh, <laughs> not so high on the priority list because uh, it's all about being flashy and being uh, seen to be active. So the digital green certificate, uh, I think this is how it's used right now and it's creating, there is the potential, there is the risk to discriminate. Uh, and going back to the discussion around vaccine equity, as long as you don't have vaccine equity guaranteed, I, I don't wanna mention, because for me, I don't wanna mention the global vaccine equity because the EU hasn't been, <laughs> Um, proactive uh, in, in uh, it's, it has been all about vaccine nationalism and regionalism. So as if that was not enough, now they also come and they tell you that if you don't have the digital degree certificate, you cannot move around. So it's kind of a consolidation of this discrimination, which was which started already last year. Uh, so I have a lot of issues both uh, with this, both globally, but also within the EU itself. That makes a lot of sense. Um, I just we have a few minutes left, so I'll take any final questions if anybody wants to pop them in the chat. But I also wanted to to um, ask you, Yanis, about where you see this going forward. So you've described it as best practice and a success story. I saw Clemens Auer in your discussion with him describes the, the, the steps that have been taken and the mechanisms that have been put in place as an example of best practice. Do you see potential for this to go beyond? And by this, I mean, I, I suppose the degree of European cooperation we've seen and, and solidarity is a big word, but but I think it's, it's it's probably okay to use it in this context. Do you see us being able to extend that into areas like, for instance, AMR, antimicrobial resistance, or any of the other huge health challenges that, that the EU is taking on and that EFA is monitoring? It, does this give on, us hope for other areas of health, I suppose, is what I'm in On the bright about. side, on the bright side, I think the whole affordability debate, because since day one of COVID-19, affordability was totally mainstreamed. Uh, mm -hmm. There was an expectation that these products are going to be affordable. So I'm happy about that. And I think that is something that will stay. Um, on the bright side, again, uh, the question of equitable access within Europe. As I said, the EU vaccine strategy prevented a divided Europe. It's fantastic that all Europeans um, have access to these products at the same time. So the question of the availability is very important. It's something that we need to see. I would love to see in other areas, including orphan drugs. Uh, for rare diseases. So the question of availability and affordability is something where I think we this will this is here to stay. The question of joining forces, be it on the regional level, intergovernmental level, or EU even pool procurement for certain clusters, because obviously you, you don't want to buy everything together. There's no point. You, you want to, um, if there is healthy competition in some therapeutic area, you don't need to uh, uh, buy together. On the question of um, the question, you're right in saying um, we see with COVID-19 the use of upfront payments. Uh, the EU vaccine strategy, the main tool was these down payments, these down payments, these advanced payments that we gave to the companies in order to guarantee any losses, to give them flexibility, to de-risk the R&D process. The use of upfront payments, and because you mentioned antibiotic, you mentioned AMR, um, the question of you know putting money public money in a jar in order to drive innovation and to empower the payers to become buyers, which is a big question and a big discussion, that is something where there is potential. I'm a bit optimistic, um, but again, 
it's not a question of simply giving the industry more incentives. It's about aligning these incentives with rewards and making sure that there is a return on this public investment. So it's not, again, it's not about giving them a blank check. And it is about what I want to see and what I hope we will see in the next few years. As I said, do you want to develop new antibiotics? Put, uh, you know, how do we say it in English? Uh, put your mouth, no, your money where your, your mouth, mouth is. <laughs> Voila. Quite literally in this case, quite literally in this case, if governments want to steer innovation for once, rather than simply being on the passively waiting at the receiving end of whatever comes out of the pipeline, if you do want to be a buyer rather than a payer, and if you want to drive and steer the innovation in a, in a needs-driven way rather than you know the industry, the usual profit-driven manner, AMR and new antibiotics specifically, where I think the industry, everyone agrees that even the industry agrees that they have dropped the ball over the past 30 years, it is an area where we can see some progress especially with the discussions around HERA um, in Brussels, the setting up of, an e, of a BARDA-like EU agency with some big discussion. Um, yeah, I'm a bit optimistic on these, on these fronts. I'm, I'm worried about the questions of regulatory flexibilities. I'm worried about the question of transparency. Um, I'm worried about the politicization of pharma. And I'm worried for you know, not being able to, as we see you know, with big tech, Pharma now is becoming too powerful, and it's 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 fine to have a healthy uh, industrial uh, sector, but also public health policy is not the same as industrial policy. Do you? That's interesting. Just to link to the last question, I'm going to take one from the from the Q and A um, from Steve Ballard about. So the link between public health and industrial policy is one thing, but Steve's bringing up the point also of climate policy to some extent and environment policy. The odds of us ever being able to make this work and get everybody vaccinated and tackle infectious diseases more broadly, let alone just COVID, is so intertwined with the climate and the environment aspect as well. Do you see an intensification of the discussion of that link or do you think we're still not successfully putting these things together? There is another nuance which is linked to COVID-19 more specifically because there is a lot of discussion, especially now with the French presidency of the EU coming up, the question of reshoring and bringing back the industries. And there, of course, there's a question of environmental standards in Europe, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, it's a more specific topic based on uh, in relation to what you just said. But it is something that, again, it really brings the world together. Uh, the emphasis now seems to be uh, we need auto autonomy. We need uh, it's a question of security and strategic security for Europe. Um, we need to boost the industry in Europe. But how do we do this? Uh, for which areas? Uh, in which way? Uh, these are very big discussions, and it even has clear uh, environmental implications, uh, affordability implications, and, and all sorts of different implications. So I expect this issue to dominate the agenda in the coming months and uh, in the very near future until the mandate of the current commission. Mm. It seems like we end up roughly where we usually do with these things, where we come back to whether these events are enough for us to take a more holistically health in all policies, bring everything together approach rather than treating these things as... There is opportunity. There is an opportunity because nobody talked about health so much in Europe before, right? So... Uh, and in Brussels and giving Brussels more power. And I think with the ongoing discussions around the EMA mandate extension, the ECDC, uh, setting up HERA, these are all uh, important opportunities. These are opportunities, obviously. And, and um, just a few years back, uh, we wouldn't even imagine. You remember with Jean-Claude Juncker, the, just the previous commission, so not, not in the distant past, you know, it was uh, small on small things and health was a small thing. And, and then now, fast forward to two years later in light of COVID-19, obviously, um, everyone's talking about health. And, and that, but that, it's a bit early to say where, where this is going to take us, oh, especially also because we're still in the eye of the storm. We are not out of it yet. Right, right. Just before we started the webinar, Yanis was uh, telling Charlotte and Mary about how busy he is because of all of the health related uh, stuff that's coming out of the, the European Commission and the European Union more generally. I think it's a really exciting time and um, reflected in us being able to set up the network and the other initiatives that Charlotte and Mary were describing that, you know, there's so much happening now on the policy side and on, on the academic and research side. It's, um, it's a good time to be doing what we do. Um, with that, we are pretty much bang on time, which isn't too bad going. Um, so I'll say thank you to everybody for coming and for posting your questions. Thank you sincerely to Yanis for joining us and, and sharing your knowledge Pleasure. and expertise. Um, you can follow the network, as um, Charlotte mentioned, on Twitter and visit the website for all the other stuff that's coming up. And we hope to see you at, at other events very soon. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.